Stefan Pelletier, ex-professor de História Militar do Oriente Médio na Escola Superior de Guerra do Exército dos Estados Unidos, é um dos maiores especialistas americanos no Iraque. Cientista político formado pela Universidade de Berkeley, jornalista, era correspondente em Bagdá em 1982, quando foi recrutado pela CIA para trabalhar como principal analista, aquele que interpreta informações e propõe políticas. Durante quatro anos, Pelletier acompanhou passo a passo os movimentos de Saddam Hussein. Com a, com a guerra entre iraquianos e iranianos por dentro, conheceu, conheceu avanços e retrocessos da diplomacia americana no Iraque e reuniu um volume de informações suficientes para decidir abandonar o serviço de inteligência, decidir abandonar o cordava da política anti-Iraque de Washington. Passou então a colaborar nos principais jornais americanos. Escreveu vários livros desfazendo alguns sobre o Iraque e o regime de Saddam, muito usados nos Estados Unidos nos dias que correm. Um deles diz respeito a essas imagens dramáticas, marcas do final de uma longa guerra entre vizinhos iranianos e iraquianos, conhecidas como um genocídio de Saddam contra os, cur contra os curdos à custa de armas químicas. Pelletier confirma que Irã e Iraque usaram armas químicas uns contra os outros, mas sustenta que o resultado da investigação da CIA provou que o gás que matou os civis curdos não era iraquiano, era iraniano. Este é o tema desta entrevista. Uma das coisas que são ditas sobre Saddam Hussein, em fazer um caso contra ele, é que ele gasta seus próprios povos. He committed genocide against the Kurds at the end of the Iran-Iraq war. What really... Specifically, what I say in my book is that both Iraq and Iran used chemical weapons against each other. They were trying to kill each, each other. The story essentially was distorted uh, here in the United States to make it appear that only Iraq used chemical weapons, that the Iraqi chemical weapons killed the Iraqi civilians, the Kurds, and that this was done deliberately as an act of genocide. In fact, we know, or I know, because I was an intelligence officer at the time, that the actual incident was a battle in which the two sides were trying to capture the city of Halabshia, and both used chemical weapons against each other, and the Kurds, who were caught in the middle, were killed. So you can't say it's genocide. Moreover, the Defense Intelligence Agency in the U.S. in the U.S. examined the battle afterwards, immediately afterwards, and they concluded that based on an examination of the corpses, that the type of gas that killed the Kurds was the gas the Iranians used, but not the Iraqis. It's called a blood agent. It's called What a is blood that? agent. It's a cyanide-based gas, and it, it, it gives itself away because the corpses, uh, the, the, the extremities are blue. So they looked at the corpses and they said, well, that's cyanide. Basically. And what was Iraq using? Iraq was using mustard gas. Totally different effect? Totally different effect. Uh, why do you think that the CIA at the time uh, used that information that you say is distorted, that Iraq was committing genocide against the Kurds? It wasn't primarily the CIA. Unfortunately, the CIA went along. But primarily, it was the Bush administration, the, the other Bush administration. Uh, up until the end of the Iran-Iraq war, there was not a great deal made of this Halabshah incident. The DIA said it was the Iranians. The Bush administration accepted that. And nothing great, no great to do was made of it. As soon as the Iraqis won the war, and it appeared that the balance of power in the Middle East had been significantly disturbed, because now the Iranians could not fight anymore, the United States realized that it had a problem on its hand in Iraq, because the Iraqis, having won the war, were now beginning to assert themselves. They were beginning to make statements to the effect that uh, um, only the Arab states in the Gulf should be responsible for the security of the Gulf. Effectively, what they were asking us was to get out, the Americans to get out. So immediately, the administration shifted, and Iraq became the villain. 
And then you began to get a lot of anti-Iraq propaganda here in the United States. And one of the main charges that was leveled was this one about the gassing of the Kurds. The uh, then Secretary of State Schultz was the one who initially made the charge. And he said, not only had the Iraqis used gas at Halabsha, but in the very last days of the war, this would be in the summer of 88, they undertook a campaign to wipe out the Kurds using chemicals. And they even went so far as to say 100,000 Kurds were killed, which was nonsense. You can't kill 100,000 people using chemical weapons in the kind of terrain you have in northern Iraq. So I would say it was done to demonize the Iraqis and to affect, cheat them of the victory they'd won and to hopefully, from the administration's side, reestablish a suitable balance of power in the Persian Gulf. At the end of the, Iran at the, end of the Iran-Iraq war, uh, you said that uh, it would be in the interest of the U.S. to uh, engage Iraq, to try to be an ally of Saddam Hussein. Well, because for years, the United States has attempted to distance itself from the Gulf. It left it up to the big oil companies to handle all of the affairs in the Gulf. I mean, this is a, a condition that uh, went on up until 1973 in the OPEC revolution. It was the big oil companies, Exxon, uh, Mobil, BP, uh, Shell, they were the ones who were in control in the Gulf. And the U.S. government pretty much followed their lead and the lead of the British government. When the British pulled out of the Gulf, and in 1973, when the OPEC revolution hit, the United States, instead of going into the Gulf, deputized, I mean, I'll use that phrase, it appointed the Shah of Iran to be America's surrogate, to look out for security in the Gulf. In other words, the United States did not want to take the responsibility for the Gulf. And it has always fought shy of becoming involved in the Gulf. Finally, it worked out a modus vivendi with the Gulf oil sheikhs, with the Saudis and the Kuwaitis and the UAE, whereby the United States cooperated with these countries to keep the price of oil at around $18 a barrel, which suited the United States and suited the sheikhs. But they never engaged Iran and they never engaged Iraq. They were always trying to shut these two out. Now, when Iraq won the war, you really, no realistic person could say you can shut out Iraq because there's 20 million people. It has the second largest reserves of oil in the world. The army had just won what was to me a convincing victory over the Iranians, and they were trying to assert themselves. At that point, I think I think the opportunity was there for the United States to engage the Iraqis in some sort of uh, uh, colloquium uh, to try to work out, as I say, a modus vivendi where we could live with them. Uh, it never happened. It never happened. Why? There was powerful interest in the United States that opposed this. Uh, obviously, there's the American Jewish community, which was, does not want to see any a uh, strong alliance between uh, the United States and any Arab power. But beyond that, I suspect there were also the oil interests who never forgave Iraq for nationalizing the oil. Uh, up until 1972, it was Exxon, Mobil, Shell, and BP had the Iraq Petroleum Oil Company concession, and they controlled the oil of Iraq. After 72 and the nationalization, that was gone. They lost it. So it always was in my mind that the oil companies wanted to get back in. So that was a, a block of, uh, in the United States that was anti-Iraq. And then the, it's surprising to me, among the liberal American community, there was a lot of sentiment for Khomeini, a lot of sentiment for Iran, uh, very pro-Iran, very anti-Iraq. As a consequence, you had the American Jewish community, you had the oil companies, and you had the uh, uh, pro-Iranian uh, faction. All three 
were very much upset when Iraq won the war. And all three were interested in uh, driving a wedge between the United States and Iraq. During the Iran-Iraq war, the U.S. became an ally of Saddam Hussein against Iran. But then, it was found later, uh, behind the back of Saddam Hussein, uh, the Reagan administration was helping Israel to give weapons to Iran. What was that uh, so-called Iran-Contra scandal? As I, try, as I try to analyze that situation, uh, in 1984, when the United States shifted to Iraq, when it began to support Iraq, the Israelis realized that it was not in their interest to see the United States draw close to Iraq. And so they began maneuvering in Washington, and the line they pitched, the line they, uh, they uh, pushed, was that Iran was going to lose the war unless the United States evened the balance, unless the United States helped the Iranians to stay in the war, the Iranians would lose. And before they lost, rather than lose, they would throw themselves into the arms of the Soviet Union. You began to hear the phrase in, in Washington, Iran is the prize. That was code for the United States should be shifting its support to the Iranians. It was nonsense. I mean, Khomeini was not going to embrace godless communism. But that approach was very persuasive to certain elements in, in the United States who were pro-Iran to begin with. And as a consequence, uh, Reagan allowed himself to be talked into uh, supporting the sale of arms to uh, Iran. Not only was it uh, ideologically uh, uh, comfortable uh, uh, approach for these e elements here in the United States, but it also was very lucrative for the arms dealers because they were making and, uh, and as a consequence, the whole thing got completely out of hand uh, because uh, we not only gave the Iranians arms, not to give them arms, we not only facilitated the sale of arms, but we actually gave the Iranians satellite photographs of the Iraqi positions to the point where they were losing battles, losing battles. And uh, the Iraqis were not stupid. Uh, once the story came out, once it was leaked in Tehran what was going on, the Iraqis put the whole thing together. At the point they realized they'd been betrayed, you then observed this very curious behavior where they didn't make any fuss. They didn't create a great to do, they just suddenly became very opaque. They didn't anymore deal with us in the same open way they were dealing with us before. And in fact, what they were doing is they were preparing the last campaign in secret. They were preparing their army to defeat Iran because up to that point, the Iraqis had been content to allow the United States to broker a truce in the UN. Once they became convinced they'd been betrayed, they then decided, we'll end the war on our own. And that was when the United States was so surprised at the unexpected victory of Iraq, when suddenly the United States woke up and realized the balance of power is completely upset. Iraq has won the war. Israel is now threatened. The American position in the Gulf is now threatened. And we brought it all on ourselves. We brought it all on ourselves with the stupidity of Iran-Contra. But uh, then the official explanation that the U.S. gave was that Iraq won because it used chemical weapons, right? I was an intelligence officer at that time, and I noticed the Iraqi behavior, and it was really smart. The Battle of al Fau, which was the kickoff for the big campaign, kicked off about 2 o'clock in the morning, on a day when it was raining, I believe. The Battle of al Fau was over in four hours. The Iranians were completely defeated. That was the first battle of the big campaign that was going to end the war. That was the cam a battle which the Americans said the Iraqis used gas. The battle took four hours. As soon as the battle was over, the Iraqis rounded up all the correspondents in Baghdad and ran them down to al Fau. So maybe within 12 hours of the end of the battle, the correspondents were walking all over the battlefield looking at the remains. Now, if the Iraqis had used gas, and if they had killed 
thousands of Iranians, the way the Americans said, the corpses would have been all over the place. There were no corpses. Why? Because the Iraqis had left a bridge open across the Shad al-Arab at which the Iranians could flee across. And that's what they did. The Iranians fled across the bridge. So as a consequence, you could sh take reporters all over and show them the battlefield and show them there's no trace of gas here. The Americans have all conveniently forgotten that now. Now they say, well, there were signs of gas, there were injections with atropine kits, and there were, it's nonsense. Uh, when, Saddam Hussein uh, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, what was that, a miscalculation? In my book, I point out that Iraq, over the course of the eight years of fighting the Iranians, ran up tremendous debts, tremendous debts. They had to because the Iranians outnumbered them three to one. And as a consequence, to stop these human wave attacks that kept coming, they had to have firepower. So they bought weapons. And in order to buy them, they had to go into debt. So they ended up the war, and they were it's extraordinary, I think $87 billion in debt. And they assumed that it would be possible to reschedule that debt. Most of the debt was held by European banks. When the United States turned against them, when the United States began saying publicly they had gassed the Kurds, they were trying to build an atomic bomb, uh, the banks in Europe didn't want to reschedule the debts. And the Iraqis were so much in debt that they couldn't even pay the interest on the debt. They kept sinking deeper and deeper and deeper. So there was that famous interview between April Glaspie, who was the American ambassador in Saddam Hussein. And he called her in, and he said to her, in effect, look, you know, you, you've got to help me out, because I can't even pay the pensions of my widows. I've got to do something. He said, call off the media campaign, the campaign of, of, of blackening the Iraqis' name. So at least do that. But also, he said, put pressure on the Kuwaitis, because the Kuwaitis had just said that all of this money that they had given the Iraqis during the war was in fact a debt and had to be repaid. Well, now the Iraqis could never get out from under the debt. So they wanted pressure put on Kuwait and they wanted the media campaign stopped. Glaspie said, I can't do anything for you. I, I can't interfere with the Kuwaitis. It's an independent country. I can't interfere with the media in the United States. That's independent. In fact, Saddam Hussein told her, that's not an answer. I, you know, you haven't given me any options. And if you read the interview between Saddam Hussein and Glaspie very closely, what he's saying to her at the end is, all right, I'll do what I have to do. But some people read into the interview also that she gave him a green light. You have to be aware of the circumstances under which the interview was conducted. Saddam Hussein had never, never granted an interview to a foreign ambassador in Baghdad. Without any warning, he called her and told her to be at the palace. He was going to, he, he had something he wanted to say. She had just enough time to get in touch with Washington, telling Washington the interview was set up, and she was ushered in. All she had to go on was the brief that she held before she walked in the door, which was that the United States is, is neutral, we're not taking sides in this dispute, even though he was sending her all kinds of messages during the interview that I want you to tell me this, she only had the authority to tell him that. As a consequence, the interview was very unsatisfactory, and that comes through. At the end of it, he invaded. You wrote uh, in your study of Iraq that uh, its regime has real legitimacy, popular support. And uh, now we say, everybody uh, here in the U.S., saying that it's the opposite, that Saddam Hussein is a dictator that can be easily toppled. Mm -hmm. What's the reality? If, if you study the Iran-Iraq war, and you know something about the circumstances under which it was fought, one thing leaps out at you, and that is this. 65% of the troops who fought the war were Shia. Now, the Shia are the co-religionists of the Iranians. Supposedly, there's a strong religious bond there so that they will pull together. In fact, it never happened. For eight years of the war, the Shias of Iraq 
fought the Iranians and held them back. The Kurds of Iraq never fought. The Kurds of Iraq were in the north, and they were organized into militias, and they kept the north free of the uh, Iranians. But in fact, the Sh Kurds never left the north. It was the Shias that were doing most of the fighting. As a consequence, at the end of the war, the situation in Iraq had completely changed. Not only had it was it obvious that it was the Shia in Iraq that had saved the country, but Saddam Hussein and the Ba'athists, in order to uh, to uh, um, keep the morale of the Shias up, had appointed many Shias to high positions in the the Revolutionary Command Council was a majority of Shias. My theory was, and I think it was legitimate, that the Iran-Iraq War forged the Iraqis into a nation. It, it brought them together. Not so much the Kurds, but the Shias and the Sunnis became a nation because they had this great epic. They had fought the Iranians for eight years, they had destroyed the Iranians, and now they were ready to embark upon a new career of being a unified nation state. It never happened because largely of what the United States did. But, but so many years after the end of that war, is still Saddam Hussein I, I, It would be hard for me to believe that he is the popular leader now that he was at the end of the war. I mean, many, the Iraqis have suffered, uh, and it would be, they would be, it would be impossible if, if they did not put a, a, a share of that blame on Saddam Hussein. Uh, but I, I, I don't think it's too far-fetched to say that the Iraqis are split in their mind. On the one hand, yeah, the, the, the regime has gotten them into desperate straits. On the other hand, they have no love for us, for the United States. And it, the Iraqis would have to be naive not to believe that we're going to war for oil. We want the oil. Therefore, how can they interpret this? They're sitting on one of the largest pools of oil in the world, oil which could be used for their benefit. Once the United States gets that oil, it's hard for me to believe that the Iraqis are going to benefit it from it in the same way that they did when the Ba'athists had the oil. Because remember, before the Iran-Iraq war, Iraq had the highest standard of living in the Middle East among Arab states. Because the Ba'athists spent the money on it. You also wrote about the water that yeah. is in Iraq. What is that? Iraq has the most extensive water system in the Middle East. It has the Tigris, Euphrates, it has the Lesser Azab River and the Greater Azab River in the north. It's a very large river system. They also have very well-developed hydraulic facilities. They have big dams, huge dams. Uh, and there has long been a plan, which has been actively considered in the West, that if you could harness the water from Turkey and Iraq, you could effectively spread it out across the whole Middle East. You could send it to Israel, you could send it to Kuwait. But the Iraqis have never cooperated in that because the Iraqis have always been at odds with their neighbors. So what I speculated in the New York Times article was that whereas most people concentrate on oil and think that America is going in to seize the oil of Iraq, there's also a theory that along with the oil you get the water. And if you control the oil and the water, you control the Middle East. Uh, this, uh, this Iraq opposition that is being helped by the U.S. Mm -hmm. now, who are those people? They have no respect of in the United States. Uh, most of the people that I know who are knowledgeable about the situation uh, have contempt for them. Uh, they've never shown anything. They've never done anything. Uh, as a consequence, uh, they are f have very close ties to the neocons, and therefore, uh, their standing in Washington is excellent, but as far as being an effective opposition, they don't have it. Who could replace? Who could replace? Essentially, nobody, because uh, uh, if you look at the history of Iraq before the coming of the Ba'ath, the country was gripped with anarchy. I mean, it was a mess. The Ba'athists are ruthless; they're really ruthless. But they impose their will. They put the country together. They held it together during the Iran-Iraq war. Saddam Hussein is the ultimate Ba'athist. He is an organization man. If he goes and the Ba'ath goes, the country falls apart.
Thank you.